the big thing now in the tax code is the child tax credit. And people forget that that was initially introduced in the mid 90s when uh, the Gingrich revolution took back Congress in 94. They were looking for some sort of uh, outreach to evangelical and religious religious right groups, and they they settled on the child tax credit, and it really was a push from you know the mor- moral majority and uh, uh, Ralph Reed and the the Christian Coalition that helped include the child tax credit in the balanced budget that passed Congress, and that was the first time that we actually recognized that again parents have this. Uh, you know these expenses associated with tr- with raising a child, and we should be lessening the load. Howdy, everyone. Welcome back to Moment of Truth. My name is Nick Solheim. I'm the COO of American Moment, and I am joined by my lovely wife, Evie Solheim. Say hi to the people. Hello. Uh, Evie just happened to to be in the room, was listening uh, to Patrick and I's episode, so we figured, what the heck, why not have her on the show? Um, So while you're here, uh, these people have listened to me for about 70 episodes. Anything really embarrassing about me that you want them to know anything you've heard it's worse it's worse it's worse and where should they where should they follow you to hear all the stories at ev fordham i i regularly tweet embarrassing photos of nick so. yeah great i i i really <laughs> appreciate that um so to get back to business uh Today, we had on Patrick Brown, uh, Patrick T. Brown, uh, as I'm informed. We talked about uh, family policy, why people um, aren't getting married, why people aren't having kids. Uh, We talked about Hungary's family policy, what we should do in the United States. And apparently, like Newt Gingrich was one of the first guys in modern conservatism to do family policy. It was all very interesting. Um, But before we get to his bio, um, just want to highlight a couple of things. Uh, Our website, obviously, is AmericanMoment.org. If you're ever so inclined to toss a few dollars our way uh, for producing all this content, our uh, donate link is AmericanMoment.org slash donate. Um, If you want to get in touch with someone on our team to get uh, into the DC space. Um, I don't know why you would do that, but if you decided you wanted to move to DC and work on the Hill, uh, that link is americanmoment.org slash join. Uh, as always, please rate and review, uh, the podcast. Please give us five stars, say really nice things. If it's somewhat interesting, uh, we'll read it on the show. So now, um, we're going to get to uh, Patrick's bio here. Uh, so Patrick T. Brown is a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, where his work focuses on developing a robust pro-family economic agenda and supporting families as the cornerstone of a healthy and flourishing society. His writing has been published in the New York Times, National Review, Politico, The Washington Post, and USA Today. And he has spoken on college campuses in Capitol Hill on topics from welfare reform to child care and education policy. He has published reports on paid family leave and or on paid leave and family policy with the Institute for Family Studies and edited an essay series featuring working class voices for American Compass. He is an advisory board member of Humanity Forward and the Center on Child and Family Policy. Uh, Patrick graduated from the University of Notre Dame uh, with a degree in political science and economics. He also holds a master's in public affairs from Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. He and his wife, Jessica, have three young children and live in Columbia, South Carolina. Wow, I one day hope to have a bio uh, that, that that is nearly that um, accomplished. We had a really interesting um, episode today. I think one of the one of the most interesting things here is that family policy is not easy. Um, there are a lot of people who think that it's, you know, as easy as moving a few economic levers and people will all of a sudden be popping out seven kids. Uh, turns out it's a little more complicated than that. What did you think of the last two thirds of the episode that you heard while standing out there? I like that Patrick, you know, it's easy to be rah-rah and we need that, but I like that he also pointed out, you know, where you can affect change on the margins, you know, where ideas that sound good maybe don't pay off as much and where things that, you know, a lot of people haven't thought about can make a change. So I I liked hearing kind of his breakdown because he clearly knows his stuff. 
Very well said. And with that, we will go to Patrick T. Brown. Patrick, thanks for coming on the pod. Thanks for having me on. So uh, as many of our listeners know, the way that we like to start the show is talk about, you know, who you are, how you got to uh, the position you're in now. So tell us about yourself. Give us the elevator pitch for Patrick T. Brown. Sure. Well, I I grew up in Seattle, Washington and escaped um, still somewhat a conservative. Uh, After college, my first job in D.C. was working for Catholic Charities. So I kind of got a little bit of a, a stint working on the the safety net side of things. And that's where I uh, sort of, you know, kindled an interest in, in politics, um, got married, uh, went to grad school, came back to DC, worked on the Hill for a couple of years, uh, doing social capital research with the Joint Economic Committee. And then uh, after I left the Hill, uh, Ryan Anderson, the president of EBPC, a, a former Moment of Truth guest, uh, gave me a call and asked if I wanted to work on family policy. And, and to me, family policy is really you know, the the key, you know, cornerstone of, of what politics should be about, because it's it's about the corner, you know, it's about the, the key unit of society, the family. And so, um, uh, you know, it's, it's exactly the kind of stuff that I've always dreamed of doing. And I think it's a really good time to be doing it. So I'm happy to be doing it. Yeah. So what were some of the things you, you mentioned you were doing work for the Joint Economic Committee, um, starting to work on um, a lot of the economic issues facing everyday Americans? What are some of those uh, skills that that are you know, skills or ideas that are applicable to what you're doing now. Yeah. So when I was on the Hill, it was really a, a unique uh, setup, right? So JC, when I was there, uh, was almost like a think tank on the Hill. And so we were able to kind of step outside of the the everyday, you know, uh, humdrum of, of political activity to think bigger thoughts. Um, and, and so when we thought about the percentage of American uh, kids who were growing up without two parents in the household or um, falling fertility rates, falling, falling marriage rates, thinking about those things and thinking, okay, well, obviously there are economic factors at work. There are cultural factors at work. There are policy uh, decisions that have been made that can put a thumb on the scale one way or the other. And so, you know, to do that kind of work, you know, it's a little bit of economics. Uh, You know, like I said, I mentioned, I I got a master's degree in, in public policy and that helps be fluent with some of the economic research that's out there. But it's also um, you know, reading sociology and, and reading political theory and, and, and thinking about how, you know, policymaking is not just getting the dyers, dials and levers of, of government action right. It's about thinking about what is politics for um, and what is the what is the reason why we're in this business in the first place. And, and then I think it really comes down to first principles. What you know, what again, what, what, what is the society? What is the core unit? And for me, it's the family and, and how we can make it possible for more Americans to be moms and dads and and, and you know, raise the next generation. And so that's what I kind of try to do. So I think this is one of the things that makes conservatives in particular somewhat skittish about doing family policy, you know, that involves some levers of, um, you know, economics and, uh, you know, some kind of, of state action. Why should conservatives care about why should conservatives specifically care about family policy? Yeah, I, I, conservatives have always cared about the family, qua the family, right? I mean, like, you know, gay marriage, uh, you know, the single parenthood crisis, a, a long history, you know, Moynihan report of conservatives worrying about the family as a cultural institution. And they're right to. I mean, it is the, the you know, the institution that we have, you know, through thousands of years, I just, just determined is the best uh, place for a child to be raised is with its, its parents. And so if you, if that's not strong and stable, um, you're going to have a lot of pathologies. And, and that's something that conservatives have always been worried about. But I think what is new um, is this appreciation for the economic factors that can alter that decision and, and certainly the policy factors. So, you know, we can get into how much um, the student loan crisis or, or something like that is actually you know thwarting family formation. But I, I think it's the the recognition that something's gone off and the fact that the median age of first marriage is now 30 uh, and, and, you know, people aren't having as many kids as they say they want to. These kind of things should push us in the direction of saying, OK, we shouldn't just accept whatever the market spits out as being the best, uh, you know, solution. Because if you think about your prime years of, of um, having a child, uh, those tend to be when you're in your you know 20s and 30s. Um, that's also when your earnings are, are lowest. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and as you age and you get more experience, your earnings go up. But 
um, you know, your, your potential of having a kid doesn't. So um, just because the the market economy, uh, you know, it has a tremendous value and, and can be a you know, tremendous force of growth doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to support family life. And in fact, in, in many important ways, can can um, strip away some of uh, family's essential character. So if you if you just open it up and say, you know, laissez faire, uh, let's go, let it rip. Um, you can you can hollow out the importance of family life, and that's where I think policy needs to to take a stand and stand. No, we 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 think families are good. We think it's important to support them in law and in policy, but there's also the worry of going too far. And I think finding that balance is is where we need to be thinking about it as conservatives. Yeah, you mentioned um, you know some of the some of the issues I think that have dogged our country as it relates to um, marriage and family formation. You know, uh, the single parent crisis. Um, gay marriage, or as I've recently heard a, a podcaster say, gay mirage, um, uh, and uh, and a couple other issues. Um, and in, in, in my view, at least kind of looking back, especially over the last 20 or 30 years, it seems like conservatives have kind of been on the losing side of, of many of these issues. Um, what do you think, from a tactical perspective, conservatives need to need to change in, in their framework um, to start winning on the issue of the family? That's a big question. Um, and it partly is it, difficult because you have to talk to people where they are. And for unfortunately, for a lot of Americans in polls, uh, you know, Gallup will, will ask if, if a man and woman have a child together, should they get married? Um, and that percentage has been dropping. And it's not only been dropping among the general public, it's been dropping among Republicans. And part of that's due to, you know, educational sorting. And as, as the Republicans has become a more working class party, they're shifting in, you know, marriage has become uh, an institution that is much more prevalent among the college educated and, and, and the well off. And it's something that unfortunately, a lot of working class couples um, no longer, you know, uh, participate in, or there's more co rates of cohabitation. And so it, it's, in some respects, you have to go back to the anthropology of the family, and and um, again, rec recognizing that uh, the family is this social institution geared toward procreation of children, right? And the costs that parents bear um, are, you know, are individually born, right? If you have a child, uh, you you have the expenses of diapers and clothes and all that sort of stuff, and it's also the opportunity cost of maybe not going up for that promotion or working shorter hours, and and those are all things that that parents um, are expected to bear. Uh, and as our society has gotten richer, that opportunity cost becomes more uh, dear, right? It's it's a bigger trade off. Now you're giving up more things because you have more economic opportunities available to you, um, and so it's it's. There's definitely a, a need for conservatives to talk about marriage and, and childbearing in a way that, that recognizes that parents do bear these costs and, and that society has an obligation to, to make it possible. Because, again, if if we're not uh, making it easier for families to, you know, <laughs> advance the human race and, and to have the number of kids that they want, um, you're going to have you know, shrinking fertility, shrinking family size and, and a lot of the sort of pathologies around that. And so, uh, you know. To get back to your your question, you know, how can we win on families? I think does go back to stressing the importance of children as as being you know a, a positive good for society, and recognizing that sometimes there are trade offs between what's good for the economy and what's good for families, and sometimes that's going to mean you know maybe higher payroll taxes to pay for paid leave or or something like that, um, and 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 being willing to soften some of the you know traditional Republican orthodoxies around supply side economics or something for a focus on. Uh, you know, meeting families where they are. Yeah, I was going to say, if you, you know, talk to your average, uh, you know, staffer on the Hill, everything you just said is socialism. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I was told we weren't allowed to do that. Um, you know, so I want to I want to get into the the nitty gritty of the of the actual uh, policy. And I think the way that I want to take it is, um, you know, on one side, look at why our current outcomes are the way they are. And then in the second part, how we can solve some of those problems from a policy perspective. So um, giving kind of the 30,000 foot view, why are people not getting married and not having kids anymore? Well, they're not getting having kids because they're not getting married. That's the the primary driver. Um, you know, like I said, marriage is becoming more and more. Uh, I think this is a phrase I'm stealing from the sociologist Andrew Churlin, uh, more and more of a, of a capstone uh, 
approach than a cornerstone. People are mm. waiting until they feel ready and they are financially secure. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's a sort of recognition that you've been you've lived a successful, you know, early adulthood and now you're ready to settle down. Mm-hmm. Um, which is not the way that marriage used to be. It used to be uh, you know, two people uh, getting married in their early 20s or even earlier and, and starting a life together. And you sort of go through those struggles of of being in your 20s and all that sort of stuff. So so that has changed and it's, be, it's been a, a cultural shift. And it's you know partly driven due to uh, higher rates of educational attainment and more people going to grad school. All those kind of things have contributed to um, an over, in my opinion, an overemphasis of sort of, you know, formal education and, and, and career advancement over building up life together. Um, and so, you know, there's also an economic story as well. I don't want to undersell that. There's definitely, um, you know, some some policies that work against people having families at earlier ages. Certainly home ownership is, is, is harder to attain if you're just starting out in life. But for the most part, I think it's it's a cultural shift. And that also goes for having children as well. Although if you if you decompose the, uh, I should say, if you, you know, sort of break out the decline in fertility by, uh, married and non-married parents ever since the Great Recession, married fertility kind of hovers. It dips a little bit, especially with COVID. But for the most part, it's it stayed pretty constant. But it, the biggest decline has been in unmarried fertility, and because there's a lot of unmarried women out there, um, that's what's really driving the decrease in the in the birth rate since the Great Recession. And so, as conservatives, we might actually have a little bit of mixed emotions because on the one hand, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, sub replacement rate fertility. That's not great for a nation. But on the other hand, um, you know, single marriage, or sorry, single parenthood is something that um, conservatives have always decried. And there's definitely, a, you know, a mixed blessing in terms of, you know, helping, you know, moms get married before they have kids. So um, these things are, are all tied up in in cultural narratives and, and again, some economic narratives as well. But it's really this sort of delayed adolescence and this this thinking of your 20s as this time to sort of, you know, you go to college, you may graduate in four or five years, you you figure out what you want to do, you travel the world, and then you settle down and, and mm-hmm. get ready to have a family. Um, that's, that's, I think, especially for the sort of college-educated crowd, that's a big driver. And then for those without a college degree, it used to be that non-college educated women were had much higher rates of fertility um because they're again their opportunity cost of having a child was very low they, they didn't have very high um you know labor market potential shall we say but since the great recession their fertility behavior is also mirroring college educated women which i think is very fascinating and, and under undercover because it, again that's that's really driving a lot of the decline of fertility and, and we can kind of think about how we can be making marriage more appealing maybe to those women without you know, while recognizing that, you know, we don't want necessarily a much higher rates of single parenthood. Yeah. I think, you know, to, to personalize this issue for a lot of our listeners, at least for me, you know, my, my wife and I have been married, we've been married 11 months now. Got to get on uh, making those um, one year anniversary dinner reservations. Right. <laughs> but, um, but in those 11 months, we, we bought a house, which is, you know, only because of the lord's provision i mean it was a very long process had put in a lot of offers yeah um we're expecting our 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 first baby here in november so it's i mean it's all this stuff is possible and i think doing it all at once um it's certainly a learning and 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 growth experience so yeah. i think and you know you're you're married and have kids as well and so it's certainly something we'd encourage our audience to uh <laughs> of course to, to to get into also but i think you're highlighting something that's very interesting um especially when you're looking at the economic picture which is the difference between um you know college educated um folks and people who were not college educated and the big the big you know difference um in that People, people who are, you know, more highly educated, I think are more apt to, I may be stealing this from, I think it was a Charles Murray book. I, I can't remember, but it, talking about, you know, they're more apt to say that um, marriage and children are not that necessary, but are the ones more likely to actually partake in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I think too, that the decrease in, um, in, uh, you know, fertility there is due to, um, both parents in a household working, uh, you know, it's commonly called the two income trap. Um, can you tell us a little more like what is the the, the two income trap um, and how does it hold people back from, you know, having as many 
kids as they want. Yeah, no, that's a fascinating question, and it's it's a it's a tough empirical knot, right? So so the two income trap comes from this book from Elizabeth Warren, as you probably know. I think it was two thousand three. Uh, back before Elizabeth Warren became the Elizabeth Warren we know and love today. Yeah. Uh, and she, Emphasis on love. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and she looked at, and again, I, I she's a law professor, so I will cut her some slack that the statistical work I think is is pretty shoddy. But, yeah. but the narrative that she spun, which I think has some truth, even if you don't have to take the whole theory, uh, you know, hook, line, and sinker, is that as – you know, in the era of the sort of single male breadwinner household, the um, mom and the family acted as a sort of safety net. So if dad loses his job, mom can do a couple hours here and there to help keep things afloat. Um, and as m- more parents work, as sorry, as more families have both parents working, um, you know, that sort of increases the, the decreases the slack for parents because now mm-hmm. you have to juggle work and, and child care and all that sort of stuff and it also bids up the price of, of housing because uh you know be, you know school becomes much more important uh there's a lot of um you know sort of uh, goods that become more expensive because more people are buying them so the price of child care goes up um and again i I don't necessarily buy the whole theory, but but the 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 insight there is that there are certain goods in family life. Housing is a huge example where because of the policy choices we've made, it is increasingly unaffordable. And, you know, the, the biggest thing that, you know, conservatives can do, or may, maybe not the biggest thing, but one of the biggest things they can do is, is really focus on on housing and, and having a, a policy of housing abundance. You know, <laughs> build baby build should be our, our watch cry because mm. we know from the empirical research that the more you build, the more babies you have. Uh, if you increase, if you decrease the price of housing, uh, people feel richer and they... Um, I have more babies. So so as a pronatal policy, um, you know, sort of leaning in toward um, more affordable, more you know, denser, uh, yeah, more generous uh, support for homeownership, that sort of thing should definitely be on the table. But th- you asked about um, both parents working and, and there's definitely some some truth to that. The question that I have, uh, when you know, I, I don't think it's as simple as women enter the workforce and they they stopped having kids because again, marital fertility hasn't declined a ton. Um, to me, it's about are there situations in which women who wish they were working less or working part time or not working at all are feeling economically pressured into working full time? And I think that's the case for some families, especially in high cost urban areas like the, the Northeast. Mm-hmm. Um, for a lot of families. They say in polls, if you you know ask women, you know, moms, um, what your preferred work status is, it's not to be working at all, and it's not to be working full time. It's stuff like flex flex work or, or working part time or, or having some sort of arrangement where the kids are in school and you're working a couple hours and then you pick them up at the end of the day. And I do think that COVID, for everything else that happened during COVID, one silver lining has been expanding the possibilities for work from home and flex work and that sort of thing. So I'm really curious to see how that enables more moms to to balance some of those issues but you know it, it, it these are these are tough and I, I think especially the solutions on offer from the left end up putting a government thumb on the scale of well we're going to subsidize child care so that both parents can go into the workforce you know as soon as baby is is six weeks old or something yeah and I think conservatives rightly react against that because you should need to have both parents in the workforce to have a stable family and, and a lot of families don't want that so why would we subsidize that? Yeah, I think one of the interesting things that I've seen with um, a lot of my friends who are also having kids around the same time is as they try to get I, I think this is where the social and the economic intersect um, is that they have you know, been so used to their, um, you know, spouse working that they've achieved a a kind of certain level of economic stasis. And so you, you know, you are used to spending X amount of money. And then, you know, you look at the, the, you know, hit your bank account would take if you were making Y amount of money, which is, you know, about half as much or, or whatever. Um, And I think a lot of people have a really hard time cutting down on consumption. What do you think about, our kind of consumerized culture, uh, what role does that have to play in all this? A huge one. I honestly think that the more I study this, I think that the you know the driving uh, fertility down, the driving of marriage uh, later in life, a huge part of it is people feeling like they need to achieve a certain level of, of material comfort in order to mm-hmm. try something difficult. 
Um, and you know, whether that's, I need to have the, the fairy tale wedding of my dream. So I need to make sure that we have, you know, five figures in the bank or, you know, six figures in the bank or whatever, yeah. um, that, that pushes marriage later in life. People feeling like they need to have all the, you know, high tech strollers and, uh, you know, especially in, in sort of professional circles in DC need to have a, a nanny or, or, you know, high intensity childcare provision. So mom can be back to work or dad can be back to work, that kind of stuff isn't necessary to have a kid, but we've sort of built this, you know, culture of safetyism, culture of, you know, if you're only going to have one or two kids, um, then you really want to invest a lot in them, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in an era where families are having three or four kids, you can kind of, there's a trade-off between- Hand-me-downs. Right, exactly, (laughs) exactly. And and so there's definitely, if you think of children as a sort of consumer good, right? There's definitely a, a sense in which even though it doesn't necessarily cost any, in fact, the cost of food and clothing is actually down from what it used to be. I think the cultural expectations on parents are up. Mm-hmm. If you if you tried to raise a child today the same way that it, you raised a child in the 1960s and gave him Jello for dinner and you know TV dinners or something, yeah. like you get CPS called on you, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I think there's definitely a, a, a higher bar now for parents, again, especially in sort of elite college educated circles that like, well, you can't just let your child run around all day. You need to be an intensive, you know, and then we have the growth of helicopter parenting and all this kind of stuff where, you know, parenting as a verb didn't really exist before the 1990s, right? It was like, oh, you have your kids and they're playing in the backyard and you might not see them until the end of the day. That kind of stuff isn't a policy decision, but Mm -hmm. it certainly is a a cultural outgrowth of, of, of how, you know, in some respects it's a, it's a result of affluence and and Mm -hmm. people have a lot of money. They want to spend it on their kids and, and that's how it goes. You mentioned uh, student loans earlier and the student loan crisis and pickle that we're in right now. What yep. role does that play? Not a ton. Um, if you look at if you look at marriage rates uh, and infertility rates among people who have high student loan debt uh, versus people who don't or people who don't go to college, there's not a big difference. Is once you get up to like you know fifty thousand dollars, especially for women, it's a little bit lower marriage rates. But it's also because those people went to grad school and they decided to take that trade off of I'm going to be a doctor and not a lot of those women decide to get married. So it's hard for me to look at that evidence and say, well, it's actually the student loans that are causing, uh, you know, these these declining marriage rates, because, again, it's happening across the board and two thirds of millennials don't have any student loan debt. So mm-hmm. that can't be the big part of the story. You know, that being said, you know, certainly with student loans, could you imagine, uh, you know, f- more targeted approaches for people who went to, uh, you know, a predatory for profit school or, you know, started a program but didn't finish it? Yeah, maybe we can tweak some stuff around the edges with income driven repayment or something. But certainly what the Biden administration is trying to push is just taking a, a complete sledgehammer to something that I think we really did scalpel for. And and this idea that, you know, I think some of our friends on the right will say like, oh, student loan forgiveness can actually be, you know, a pro family measure. I don't I think they're going to be disappointed when they don't see birth rates or, or marriage rates come up afterwards. You want to get more involved with American Moment? Do you want to get off the couch and stop just watching a podcast about the issues you care about? Then you need to go to AmericanMoment.org slash join. Join. If you fill that form out, one of our team members will meet with you and we'll discuss how best to get you involved in politics and public policy here in D.C. Maybe that involves you coming and working at a think tank or a congressional office. Maybe you're in business and it means just holding on for a few years until we get the next presidential administration. Maybe you're a very wealthy person who wants to give us a bunch of money. Either way, go to AmericanMoment.org slash join to meet with a member of our team and get involved more substantively in trying to save this country. It's not enough to listen to podcasts. You actually have to do something. Yeah, I think one of the biggest, you know, um, I think the unfortunate investment is not, uh, you know, you getting $50,000 of student loans at 18 or whatever, as much as it is the time that you're never going to get back, Um, especially, you know, as you mentioned, if you decided you're going to get a master's, you're going to get a doctorate. And, you know, by the time you're out of that, you're, you know, 35 or or (laughs) whatever, you know, depending on how long it takes you. I would love to see more colleges and universities be more intentional, especially religious ones. Like, mm-hmm. you know, so I went to um, University of Notre Dame for undergrad, go Irish. Um, and I would love to see Notre Dame and, and other Catholic colleges be more intentional about like, OK, we've got a decked out career center with internships and, you know, McKinsey comes into all this stuff. Mm-hmm. But how much do people talk about? 
finding your spouse in college. I mean, this is a prime time for, you know, if you're looking for someone who shares your values and has shared experiences and might want to have a kid someday, like this should really be, a, you know, a golden opportunity. Nobody talks about that. Mm-hmm. And it would be, you know, seen as kind of uncouth, right? But it, 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 it's a disservice we're doing to younger men and young women if we're not at least planting that seed in their ear. And whether that's church or whether that's colleges or whether, you know, any other social institution, having more emphasis on you know just making that available and 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 you know trying to encourage people to be thinking about that in earlier ages rather than saying well you know sell your wild oats in your 20s and then once you're ready to settle down you know time passes before you know it and especially mm-hmm. for unfortunately a lot of women will get into their mid 30s and you know realize they only have a few years of of um you know potential fertility left and that can be really devastating and so you know the fact that we're not talking about that more i don't think that's necessarily a policy choice although you could imagine maybe uh but i think civil society and and and, you know again educational institutions certainly churches um need to be doing a better job of of just planting that seed in young people's ears protestant schools i think have a a phrase for that i believe it's called ring by spring (laughs) Uh, i had a a lot of a lot of friends in college that uh that went that route and it seems to be working out pretty well for him yeah um so i want to spend some time now talking about some of the potential uh solutions um and there are a lot of them mm-hmm. um i think probably the easiest place to start um is on hungry uh, which is what everyone on the right loves to talk about and everyone on the left loves to hate on yeah. so um let's talk about that what are, what are some of the things that they're doing um right and wrong um, and how could we apply some of those lessons learned uh, to our American system? Yeah, well, Hungary is super useful as an example just to show that another alternative is possible. If nothing else, I think for a long time when you talked about family policy, people would think, oh, you mean Sweden or you mean Scandinavia or something. And you can and that's very, you know, uh, top down, progressive. You know, you get the child that, you know, six months into a government run child care. Uh, you know, you have um, very aggressively egalitarian pay leave programs where you're they're trying to incentivize both parents to take pay leave because they think that's really important. And it's it's really, you know, again, it's sort of a progressive approach to pay to, to family policy. And, you know, the left has always been sort of big onto that. And and so I think having Hungary as an example of another another way of doing things right now. I don't love a lot of the things they're trying to do, or at least the way they're trying to go about them. But I think in the context of Hungary, maybe it makes sense. You know, like like the, one of the things that they do is they forgive, you know, the, the student loan balance and, and tax rates and stuff for women who have, um, you know, four more kids. I don't think I would ever fly in the United States, but for a country like Hungary that wants to increase its native born population, like I, I get that. Um, it, you know, so I, but it has, to, we have to recognize like, again, what's going to work in Hungary and, and what might appeal to sort of Hungarian national interest is not going to be the same we're much more libertarian people here in the U.S. Uh, and, and not necessarily libertarian as in like, you know, the libertarian movement. Nobody's reading uh, Von Mises out there or whatever. But um, just in terms of in our blood, you know, don't tell me what to do. We don't like social engineering. We don't want to get the sense that the government is is getting overly involved in matters of marriage and fertility. So we have to have a much more, you know, gentle approach to you know, at the very least, getting rid of penalties of, of marriage. And, and some people would say we need to to explicitly promote marriage. Now, the difficulty with that is a lot of the people who are getting married, as we've talked about, are already doing fairly well, right? So having a marriage bonus in the tax code or having programs that that explicitly provide benefits to married couples um, is basically, you know, taxing working class people to provide benefits for, for you know, well-off college-educated parents. Um, so, so that doesn't necessarily jive too well with what we're trying to do. But Hungary's, you know, insight is that there's another, we don't just have to take what the market gives us. We can be creative about how we can be setting, you know, the status quo in the government to not just be neutral to the cost of having a family, but, but, you know, like I say, taking that cost off the shoulders of parents and, and spreading it out a little bit and thinking about what it would mean to put parents first rather than just, you know, whatever the economy wants. So in that sense, I think Hungary can be very valuable, even if it wouldn't sign on to their, you know, specific prescriptions. So you're talking about some of the, um, you know, ways that we have to look at um, family policy from a more, you know, I guess, moderate per- perspective uh, because of the, you know, <laughs> you say you say that we're like a libertarian people, but, 
you know, it's not like people are saying, I don't want a driver's license anymore. <laughs> right. Or like, I, yeah. you know, I want to be naked in public or whatever. They're not that kind of, uh, of libertarian. But um, what what sorts of things like can we do? Or, or I suppose maybe a better place to start is what sorts of things have we done in the past that have been, um, you know, minor incremental changes to help people or attempts that have failed wildly? Yeah. Give us the history of it. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole history of, of schemes that, you know, never got off the ground. Uh, it, Nixon, actually, a, a surprising amount of, of, of action took place during the Nixon administration where, you know, they were talking about a negative income tax, which was sort of would have been the a replacement to the or income tax credit that we have now. Um, there, there were a, a federal child care plan actually passed Congress under Nixon and Pat Buchanan convinced him to veto it, um, which was, uh, you know, again, a, a good sign that for, for Pat Buchanan's finger on the pulse of what would what the right would become. Uh, and so, you know, there there have been sort of halting steps toward it. I think the, the big thing now in the tax code is the child tax credit. And people forget that that was initially introduced in the mid 90s when uh, the Gingrich revolution took back Congress in 94. They were looking for some sort of uh, outreach to evangelical and religious religious right groups. And they, they settled on the child tax credit. And it really was a push from you know the moral majority and uh, uh, Ralph Reed and the, the Christian coalition that helped include the child tax credit in the balanced budget that passed Congress. And that was the first time that we actually recognized that, again, parents have this, uh, you know, these expenses associated with with raising a child and we should be lessening the load. So that started off by taking some, you know, uh, whatever, a couple hundred dollars off of their, their taxes at the end of the year. It's grown over time. Uh, the Biden administration tried to supercharge that and pay that to everybody, uh, regardless of of their um, income back last year. And and that ran into some problems because I think as conservatives, we still recognize the value of work. So if you're just providing a benefit without any connection to work whatsoever, you run the risk of recreating some of the old welfare programs, which we know had perverse incentives. And so I think, you know, Republicans, you know, probably correctly oppose that. But the question is, OK, so if you're not going to do basically welfare through the back door, what are you going to do? And that's where, you know, I'm a huge fan of of what Senator Romney's doing with the um, Family Security Act. And and he's introduced that again with with uh, Senator Daines and, and Senator Burr. And basically what that would do is, is consolidate a bunch of these, you know, the child independent care tax credit, you know, the adjustment for different dependents, put them all into one and just say, if you're a family and you meet a certain income threshold because we want that connection to work, you're going to be getting a stable monthly payment every month to help pay for, you know, whatever the basic necessities, pay for private school tuition, whatever that is. We trust parents to be the the best steward of the resources for their family. And we recognize that they are bearing the cost of raising that future generation. So if we're able to, to collapse some of these benefits that are out there and and give parents, you know, more resources, uh, we can we can strengthen the families and 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 in, it has an indirect way of also you know um, reducing the marriage penalty as well. So there's definitely a lot of reasons to be um, attracted to that kind of approach. Again, it's it's not as explicit as something that you might see from you know Victor Orban or 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 some of our more you know muscular friends on the right. But it's it's in some respects is very technocratic, but it's but it's doable. And there's there's a, you know, a, a pro-life case to do it. There's a pro-family case to do it. And I think that it is the kind of thing that, uh, you know, if you're a populist or if you're somebody who's more, you know, center, maybe center right, there's a lot of reasons for people to kind of get on board and think about, well, why why shouldn't we be making it so parents have a little more extra money at the end of the month? And has there been any, like, polling on how popular or something like that is among the American people? Yeah, we're working on it. Uh Again, the, the biggest critique of the Biden tax credit, which I frankly did not expect when that rolled out last year, I kind of thought, hey, who, who doesn't love free money? Right. Yeah. Um, well, but, free. Money. Right. Right. You right. Know, whatever. Exactly. But I thought, <laughs> you know, hey, you know, it's especially post covid, you know, all this kind of stuff. But so the my uh, my shop and the Institute for Family Studies ran a series of focus groups with working class parents in uh, southern Ohio, Atlanta, Georgia and Texas, San Antonio, Texas. And what we heard was, you know, these are all parents who are benefiting from the mm-hmm. expanded child tax credit. And what they said was, it really doesn't seem fair to me that I'm working my tail off 
uh, to provide for my family and, and, you know, put food on the table and, and working 40 hours a week. And my neighbor down the street who doesn't have a job is getting that same benefit for mm-hmm. nothing. And there's that fundamental sense of reciprocity, of, of fairness, of feeling like you've paid into the system that I think just a universal child credit with, with no connection to work, um, just rubs people the wrong way. And, you know, and again, there, there's reason, you know, there's administrative simplicity, there's a sort of equity, you know, like I get the arguments from the other side, but I think as a political matter and as, as responding to this deeply inherent American sense of valuing the dignity of work and, and, and feeling like we're all paying into the system mm-hmm. in some way, having a connection to work is really important. And I think the, the softness of the Biden proposal it, it along, in, a, in a lot of ways reflected this, this suspicion of, you know, hey, this there's no strings attached. There's no, you know, connection to the workforce. And, um, you know, our friends Orrin Cass and, and Wells King over American Compass, they came up with their own sort of version of, of a child benefit plan, did some polling around that, and that tested much better. So I do think that there's a reason to find ways of supporting parents because, again, having a kid can be very expensive and mm-hmm. we want to make it easier for people to do that. But also, we, do, we don't want to just ignore the lessons of welfare reform in 96 and, and to turn our back on the importance of work, it, having somebody in the family be that role model for that kid. Yeah, I'm 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 sure that many of our listeners did not expect to come into this episode hearing that Newt Gingrich was like the the harbinger <laughs> of uh, he had to be worked on. It, yeah. You know, it wasn't automatic. There was a lot of grassroots. There's uh, a lot of grassroots push to get that to happen. But it, you know, again, we we forget. That, the, go back and read the contract with America. It was surprisingly, you know, I won't, I won't say based, but it, it had some pretty <laughs> aggressive. And, and even back into the 1980s when when President Reagan was elected, um, they had, uh, I think, what they called the Family Protection Act. And that was really, you know, talk about red meat. That was like, I'm, it's pretty amazing to look back and think like this was even politically possible. But unfortunately... Um, you know, the people who were appointed to the White House decided, well, we really need to focus our energy on tax cuts. Mm-hmm. And that's what and, and that's what sort of re- rid the, uh, won the day. Same with uh, in the Bush administration, 2001, um, you know, President Bush ran on uh, catalyzing civil society and giving money to faith based groups to do outreach to, you know, working class, low income people. And it was decided that the the better use of time was to reduce the estate tax because that's what really matters, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, time and time again, we've seen sort of the institutional Republican Party opt for what's best for business over mm-hmm. what's best for the, you know, families. Uh, and I think, you know, the momentum that I sense on the right, especially among you know folks who listen to this podcast and and other other younger enthusiastic you know conservatives. Is that it's time we flip that on its head, and and I I really do think that we can sense a sense you know we have to be concerned with with you know unintended consequences, and so if we if you know if you if you have a six thousand dollar child tax credit that could have its own you know negative out- outcomes at some point, but but I think that we're now at that point where having the family as the key not only a key cultural unit of society, which again, I, that's that's always been part of Republican orthodoxy, but seeing families as the institution that should have the economic responsibility for themselves, not offshoring their responsibilities to the government or, or to corporations, mm-hmm. but really trying to make them self-sufficient and, and giving you know, giving them the tools they need to be responsible uh, members of their community and, 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 and responsible parents, that I think has a real bright future on the right. So- we were talking a lot about, um, you know, fertility and how to encourage people to have children in this kind of like gentle sliding scale. You have to you have to operate under uh, to convince people to do that. What should we do about marriage, about declining marriage rates? What what kinds of similar solutions can we implement to increase those rates? Yeah, that is a. Uh... You get a lot of uh, grandmas out there to, to nudge their grandsons. Uh, no. <laughs> um, it, for me, it was a great grandmother. Yeah, that, that, see, that I'm me. telling yeah. you, man. Uh, no, the uh, it's tough. It's re- especially for the college educated. It's really tough because they're doing really well. And in this again, it's a problem of sort of affluence. It's a problem of the, you know, the, literally you can travel the world and and you know pursue a career, and it's a lot of fun to do that. 
and you have to kind of convince people to make that sacrifice to say, hey, look, there's more important things. So that that is, I think, a cultural push as much as anything. For the folks who are not college educated, uh, you know, working class Americans, uh, you know, the guy who's the the rock star on this is Brad Wilcox at the University mm-hmm. of Virginia, done a lot of work on marriage penalties and, and the declining culture of marriage among among low income and working class Americans. And there I do think that policy has a role to play. Um, if you're two uh, cohabitating parents, and you get married, you can lose a, a, a very hefty chunk of safety net benefits of your earned income tax credit, and and that's crazy. Mm-hmm. Why would we penalize people for doing the right thing? It's because it's cheaper, right? It, it, it scores well on, in the CBO score, and so um, you know Republicans like it because it, it costs less. And of course, Democrats aren't going to fight for marriage because they don't believe in it. They, they don't really see a role for the family to have any sort of normative claim whatsoever. It's just sort of a collection of individuals who have to share a, a roof together until we can give them enough you know, government benefits to get the kids into childcare and the parents back to the workforce as quick as possible. Uh, and, and Republicans have been unwilling to invest in, in, in smoothing out some of those marriage benefits. Uh, so you know, it's it's a little bit of a of an army answer, but I do think that the getting rid of marriage benefits in the tax code would be a big start. And then it gets to much naughtier questions because it comes to, you know, what makes somebody marriageable? Mm-hmm. And, and you know, in a lot of parts of the country, if, if there are, you know, if the uh, working class jobs have been hollowed out, offshoring, et cetera, et cetera, um, it can be tough to find a, a, a marriageable mate, right? And so those those are really tough and those are sort of beyond my pay grade, but it gets back to some of the stuff that certainly Oren has written about and, and other folks as well, rebuilding a, 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 an emphasis on work and, and, and making sure that, men specifically are able to be provider and able mm-hmm. to be someone who um you know woman can can look at you and say hey, yeah he's somebody i want to hitch my wagon to because um you know in a lot of cases if they, if their earnings aren't strong enough the woman just hey i can just do it, do this mm-hmm. myself and and i don't have to worry about or i don't have to put up with somebody who's who's going to be a, a drag on my resources right and so um yeah, again marriage is obviously much more than just an economic proposition, but there has to be an economic <clears throat> logic to it. Otherwise, people won't do it. Yeah. I mean, that's the interesting thing about family policy is it kind of touches everything. You know, you've got a lot of the the economic stuff that um, Oren's working on. Um, and then Brad Wilcox, also former uh, Moment of Truth guest. Um, we had a great episode with him uh, way back when that our listeners should go back and check out if you find this one interesting. Um, I think something else, too, is like, just how bad our food and eating culture is now, right? People are not people are not healthy. Some people are very um, overweight. I used to be one of them, so <laughs> I can say it. Um, and 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 a lot of people, you know, need to even get in like a physically healthier condition in order to in order to be in a household. So, um, well, and in building off of that, I I do think that there's. Uh, I'm going to get canceled here. Uh, Go for I do it. think there's a, a, a toxic sort of, obviously I want everyone to feel affirmed and all that sort of stuff, but it can go too far. And especially when it comes to the sort of self-care, you know, uh, <laughs> overly, um, overly solicitous of, oh, you know, you do what's right for you. Mm-hmm. You know, hey, that guy's, uh, you know, bad news. You should move on. Um, it was, certainly doesn't contribute to healthy relationships. It, you know, divorce rates are have come down from where they were, but they're they're not great. And as we've moved away from marriage as being the sort of, you know, covenantal bond or you know, the sort of promise that you're going to be together thick and thin to being just another in a series of contracts that you can, you know, sign on to and leave whenever you mm-hmm. want. That's not that's not healthy. And, and also, you know, about the the eating and, and stuff too. I I, th- I think that there's a lot of uh, there's a there's definitely a movement to make singleness and childlessness just as socially valued and, and respected and supported mm-hmm. as as being a married person and 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 not i mean we, we see the, the <laughs> i don't recommend going on to reddit slash child free but if you ever like want to see terrible, the worst dude. of humanity i mean these yeah. people are complaining about paying taxes for schools and all it's like yeah i post public schools for a different reason yeah. but um you know there's definitely a lot of people out there who say why should I have to pay for your decision to have a child? Mm-hmm. Which, you know, ignores all the sort of externalities of, of why we need kids to, you know, be the future workers of America, but also just like, again, what is politics for? Is it for maximizing consumption and individual pleasure and, and you know, just helping us 
consume as much as we want without mm -hmm. any obligations? Or is it helping us to fulfill those obligations as parents, as spouses, as members of the community? And I think that is a really big cleavage among, you know, between the left and the right on this. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's why I think that, um, you know, your family nagging you at Thanksgiving about, you know, when's the baby coming or yeah. when are you getting married or whatever? This is actually a good thing. It's, it's you know, very traditional social pressure, uh, you know, to do the things that families are meant totally. to do. Yep. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit, something we were talking about a little before the show, um, and that is uh, Dobbs and the pro-life movement uh, more broadly. It feels like the conservative movement, I think as you said it, you know, has caught the car. We're there uh, and, and we've got it. And it's, oh, what do we what do we do now? Yeah. So, Patrick, tell us, what do we do now? <laughs> yeah, no, I, we, we definitely caught the car. And it, it's great. I, you know, I it, it's a moment that a lot of us never thought would happen. And, and you know, full credit to President Trump for sticking by his nominees, full credit to Leonard Leo and all the people who, you know, marched and prayed and rallied all that stuff to make this mm -hmm. moment possible. And it's a huge opportunity and we could blow it, frankly. Um, I think the last couple months post Dobbs. I didn't predict how much scaremongering and, and just, you know, frankly, misinformation out there around you know, ectopic pregnancies and all that kind of stuff. That's you know, not my focus, but I do worry that we're not prepared to address some of that. But I, I, I think that we're starting to get more savvy on that. But we can't just talk about abortion in the context of, you know, reducing supply, um, you know, making passing a six week abortion ban or, or you know, a federal personhood amendment or anything like that. It would be great. But unless you're addressing the demand for abortion as well, we're never going to get to that point that we're all working toward where abortion is no longer, you know, just illegal, but unthinkable, right? We need to be thinking about the economic factors and some cultural factors that, that drive women towards choosing abortion. And again, this kind of breaks down along class lines, especially for women without a college degree, working class women, working women working in retail and such, they just feel like they can't financially afford another mouth to feed. And, and that to me is, is a tragedy because if there's one thing the federal government is good at, it, it's it's you know writing checks, right? And so if there's ways that we can get more money to uh, you know low income moms, again the, the the Romney plan, which I like so much, actually starts paying that monthly child benefit pre birth. So the mm. last three months of pregnancy, you can kind of build up a little bit of nest egg to, to deal with some of those costs related to childbirth. Um, and and you know you could talk about stuff like paid leave or or you know protecting from pregnancy discrimination and that kind of stuff. But recognizing that you know for them. For that population specifically, it's going to require resources and it's going to require accompaniment, right? So I love Marco Rubio's bill talking about building up you know, mentorship programs for, for low income moms who feel like I wasn't expecting this. Where do I turn? Hey, look, there's this there's this group of other women who have gone through this who can talk to me, point me to resources. It's catalyzing the work of civil society and nonprofits and churches who can who can build that web of support. Mm -hmm. That's going to be more valuable than any government program. But we have to be doing both, right? For the upper educated folks, uh, you know, people who, you know, get pregnant and they're and they're not ready for it or something. Um, yeah, that's that's a little bit harder, but there's still things we can do around, again, um, you know, prevent against pregnancy discrimination, make it easier for for new moms to sort of do flex work or, or some paid leave or something. Uh, again, you know, the super diehard progressive advocates are always going to see abortion as like, you know, the sacrament and that they believe it is. But a lot of people in the middle who who you know see the Dobbs case get handed down and they're they're a little freaked out and they're like what is this going to look like are we going to you know live in a theocracy or something if we are able to to point to a, a coherent set of policies that address some of these big drivers for women and say hey look you know you'll get priority access to a child care voucher if you're a low income mom um, you know you'll get a, a very you know modest but but you know broad based uh, paid leave program just to make sure that 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 initial couple months where you're still recovering from childbirth, uh, you know, maybe we can make sure there's some money in your pocket and and, and make sure that you and, and baby are healthy by ex expanding Medicaid to uh, uh, up to a year postpartum as, as, as Tennessee and South Carolina and some other states have already done. That kind of stuff, I think, can can soften the blow. I, again, I, I think there's a moral reason to want to support moms and babies, but I think there's a political one, too, because if, we're, if we don't do that, then the other side is just going to hammer us with that old stupid line about how you guys only care about the baby till it's born. Well, obviously it's not true, but it's much easier to prove that's not true when we can say, hey, look, there's crisis pregnancy centers. Texas is leading the way in, in funding resource centers for moms who have, um, you know, pregnancies. There's other states that are doing other stuff to, to build that 
not just government safety net, but but civil society and, and building those resources among moms because they're going to need it. I think this is something that's not often talked about and is probably really helpful for some of our listeners, especially those who work in the conservative movement to know what's the breakdown and rough is fine. I don't expect you to rattle off decimal points or anything like that, but what's the breakdown of, of, you know, women having abortions, you know, due to economic or social or, you know, health reasons? Yeah. Like what's the general breakdown there? There's not great data. The data that does exist comes from the Guttmacher Institute, which used to be affiliated with Planned Parenthood. So I, I take it with a little bit of grain of salt, but I think the most recent study of theirs that I read estimated that about 40% of, of abortions were chosen due to economic reasons. Now that can cover a lot of different things, but you already have children at home and you feel like you can't afford more. You you feel like, you know, your, your jaw would be, I mean, that can kind of cover a, a lot of different things. Um, and then, you know, the amount of abortions that are, you know, deemed necessary for health is so small and they get blown out of proportion every time because it's easy for the left to demagogue on. But it's it's real. I mean, and, and there's just no state that would ever co consider um, you know, banning procedures that would save the life of a mother, because obviously, you know, unfortunately, sometimes that has to happen. But again, it's a, it's a fraction of an edge case. And, you know, to the extent that, again, it, it's about, you know, there's always going to be some people who choose abortion for, you know, selfish reasons. But if there are, if there are, you know, approximately half of abortions that can be addressed by better public policies and, and, and building that culture that welcomes children. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the hardest thing to do. And, and you know, this as well as I, no government policy is going to change people's hearts. It, it can it can provide people a permission structure to say, hey, you know what? I was going to, you know, I was a little skeptical of this 12-week abortion ban that my state legislature is considering, but now we're going to have, a, you know, broader safety net for moms. So I think I'm okay with that. That, I think, is is definitely, you know, something that people can change their minds on. And I think that having a a, a public policy agenda that that prioritizes children, right? That that says we think children are good. We want to protect women and, and the babies they carry, and give parents the choices they need to provide for that kid. However, is you know is best for them. Whether that's you know uh, having a parent at home or, or whatever, we want to give parents the the control over their child's schools so they're not being taught stuff that uh, you know is crazy and, and counter to their values. We want to give parents more choices when it comes to when their kid graduates high school. So they don't feel like if they their kid doesn't get into college that they're going to have, you know, not a lot of job prospects. We need to be funding vocational ed and apprenticeships and all that kind of stuff. If we really focus on the responsibilities of parents to their kids and, and, and making life easier for parents, you know, I pronatalism is very expensive. I don't I don't approach this stuff as saying, how can we juice the birth rate? Because I think that's actually really tough to do. But if we can say, let's build a culture and a policy apparatus that that celebrates parenthood, that recognizes the importance of family life, that that says, hey, you know, we spend a ton on old people. Let's think about diverting some of those resources to to young kids, because because it is it, you now they're the, like Whitney Houston saying, right? Children of the future um, and, and th that kind of stuff, I think can play really well politically and it gives us a vision for what our politics should be that's about something as as fun as it can be that's something more than owning the libs or, or or going viral on twitter it's actually saying this is what politics should be about i could not agree with you anymore um patrick where can people keep up with you and keep up with the work that you're doing well always uh feel free to visit our website we're at www.eppc.org i'm on twitter at ptb rights and uh you know just drop me a line Thank you for coming on the show. It's a pleasure. Mike. Thanks again for tuning into another great episode of Moment of Truth. Um, make sure to follow Patrick um, and all his scribblings uh, at the at the links that he mentioned, um, and I think we'll have those in the description as well. Um, as always, follow us um, on all platforms at AM Moment Org. Um, Feel free to to send us an email uh, about the show, um, you know, potential guests you want to have on feedback or whatever. That's podcast at AmericanMoment.org. Um, as always, rate and review the show. Uh, please give us five stars. I, I it may not feel like it helps. I promise it does. Um, and feel free to drop any, you know, topics or potential guests or whatever uh, in your review. Thanks for tuning in and we look forward to seeing you next week. 
Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.